Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to pick up in verse 11 and go through the end of the chapter, verse 18. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 through 18. Today we're going to look at Jesus as our high priest. Now in Old Testament times, you have the tribe of the Levites and they take care of the tabernacle and then later the temple. And the descendants of Aaron, the first high priest, the, the oldest son who passed down generation to generation, will be the next high priest. And so throughout their history, there are quite a few who served as a high priest, and that's going to kind of lay the background for what we're going to see in Hebrews chapter 2 and um, understanding Jesus as our high priest. So Hebrews chapter 2, <clears throat> beginning in verse 11, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of your congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now the first thing about Jesus as our high priest is that he has suffered with us. What does it mean when it says that he who uh, sanctifies and when we're sanctified are all one source. Uh, sanctification uh, is not super spirituality. The word sanctified means be set apart to God. And if you belong to Jesus, you are set apart to him. And so we're the ones that are sanctified and Jesus is the one who's doing the sanctifying, uh, setting us apart. And so they all come from the same source, God the Father. Here's what that means. Jesus has become one of us and therefore he calls us brothers. Family. I know, you remember that old song? I'm surprised you're a part of the family of God. I'm sorry, uh, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Uh, that's like, this. so it's a, that we are family. Uh, and so he has become one of us, that, that he who sanctifies, all sanctified. That's why he's not ashamed to call him brother. Let me just say, if Jesus is not afraid to call me family, we should not be afraid to call him family. And declare that we belong to him. As a matter of fact, he's now going to rapid fire three verses from the Old Testament. The first one's from Psalm 22, 22. Then Isaiah 8, 17. The next verse, Isaiah 8, 18. I will tell you of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I'll sing your praise. You know, put my trust in him. And again, behold, and I and the children that God has given me. Here's what he's saying. That Jesus can sanctify us, call us brother, be our high priest, declare his name and all that because he has come down and he knows what it's like to be one of us. He has, he has, he has suffered with us and the reality is there's a tremendous amount of suffering in our world. In fact, Rob Maxey's spent his career working with students and he tells this story that 23 kids came out to breakfast club on this particular day on campus. I don't know what drew Jessica out. The chocolate chip pancakes? Of course. Her friends, but Jessica was searching for something. Breakfast club is another open door that one of the local campuses in our area has extended to us. We first approached the school a few years ago. We didn't come to them trying to promote our program. We just came to serve. After serving the campus for a while, we asked the question, how would you feel about us having a breakfast club before school in a classroom? We assured the school that we would feed hungry kids, yet also show video clips and have small group discussions about real life issues. They know we're Christ followers and we were clear that there would be conversations about faith, yet all would be welcomed. The school embraced the idea and the first teacher asked to host us agreed. Each week, about 20 mostly non-Christian and hurting kids showed up before school. We served hot chocolate, chocolate chip pancakes, pastries, and other goodies. Remember what Jesus did with a few loaves and fish? Music was pumping and the feel was very inviting. Jessica entered the classroom with her head hung low and her hair covering her face. It appeared she addressed to shock and to get a reaction out of people. As she entered the room, heads turned, and the vibe in the room was clearly, why is she here? I introduced myself and sat Jessica at a table with a group of girls and a female staff person. I noticed that her left arm had dark and bold writing covering it. I asked out of curiosity if I could read it. She agreed and seemed excited that somebody had even noticed. 
It says, sometimes the words that hurt the most are the ones you don't say, but are seen in your eyes while you judge me. It's the ones that are said behind my back. And I bet you have no idea what I've been through. I bet you never asked or even cared. It was time to start our discussion. I couldn't get the writing of her arm out of my head. And sure enough, as God would have it, none of the technology worked that morning. Plan B. I quickly prayed under my breath and whispered to Jessica if she would mind standing and reading the words on her arm to the group. Without hesitation, she shot to her feet and boldly proclaimed the poem she had written on her arm. I thanked her and then I led a large group discussion about the poem. It was awesome. She felt validated and other kids were made aware of others and the pain and sense of isolation that many others have. Jessica's been every week since. The Breakfast Club is gaining a reputation of a place where you won't be judged and people care. Over 30 kids now attend and even some staff to pack the room this week, excited to hear about the hope that only Jesus can provide. Do you know why Jesus, why we know he loves us? Because he's experienced loneliness and rejection and mockery and the stares and the comments under the breath. They're all recorded in the Bible. Jesus is our high priest because he knows what it's like to be one of us. And he knows what you're going through. And he cares about you. That's good news. That's why you say amen. There you go, good. Now, not only is Jesus our high priest who has suffered with us, but he's also the one who's brought victory to us. Look what it says in verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So the, the children, that's us, we, we are flesh and blood. If you're not sure, look at yourself. Jesus became a human being. Not like sort of human or superhuman or kind of human or appeared as human or something. He became a full human being. Now, realize at the same time, he's fully God, so he's not quite like you. But still a human being. Now, why did Jesus become a human being? The Bible tells us right here, he had a specific purpose in mind, a particular goal. That he, that he himself likewise partook the same things, that through death, God can't die. Well, thank you, yes. You're like, mm, let's think about this for a minute. God can't die. So Jesus becomes a human being so that he can die for us, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. The word destroy uh, is a picture word that means to take a tree, pull it up, and throw it away. See, Jesus didn't cut it off because if Jesus cuts it off, it could grow back. Jesus pulled it up root and all and threw it away because when he destroys it, it's destroyed once for all for good and done. So he destroyed, but now watch what it says. It says that he has destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now I want to clarify something here. The devil does not decide when you die. Read the book of Job. The devil is not, he doesn't have the power of death over you. So what is the devil's power of death? The devil's power of death is that he uses us to make us afraid to control us. The fear of death becomes a weapon for him. And those who don't know Jesus, what happens to them? Instead of knowing that we have victory over the fear of death, instead, through fear, we're slaves, verse 15, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. In other words, Satan likes to use our fear of death as a weapon against us to manipulate us and to try to enslave us to what he wants to do. But if we know Jesus Christ, we know that the power of death has been defeated. It's been rooted up, torn up, and thrown away. Now, I've liked music my whole life, been involved with music most of my life. I play the bass guitar on Sundays. And, um, you know, it doesn't really matter whether or not you're involved in music. Most people like music. And most people have bands that they listen to and I'm no different. And so I have bands that I like. I have bands that I really like. And then there are a very small handful of bands that are like right at the top of the list. Like favorite bands. Like the kind of bands that you could listen to all the time. So one of those bands is Disciple. Um, I mean, I've been one, one of my favorite bands for a long, long time. One of my other bands, like right there real close to them was a band called Demon Hunter. Now, Demon Hunter is a Christian hardcore metal band. A few of you probably wouldn't like their music. <laughs> um, it's, it's, 
it's aggressive. It's just the way music ought to be. I mean, it just puts you in the mood for worship. I just, it's, it's awesome. Now, Demon Hunter is a, they're, they're, they're a studio band. What that means, they spend the majority of their time in the studio writing songs and recording songs. They've actually been a band for 20 years. It's pretty remarkable the band can stay together for two decades. It's unusual. And in those 20 years, they've actually released 11 albums. They rarely tour. Most bands release a new album and they go on a big tour to try to promote their new uh, songs and everything. Demon Hunter doesn't work that way. They rarely, rarely tour. It's never been several years since they did their last tour. However, because it was their 20 year this year as a band, they decided to do a, a brief tour, 19 stops, that's it, 19 of them. Monday night, one of those stops was Mesa, Arizona. Yes, I was there. Why would you even think I wouldn't be there? This is one of my favorite bands. As a matter of fact, I immediately got pinged when they released that they were, uh, you know, I was notified that they were going on tour. So I hopped on and bought tickets for me and my oldest son, who's a big fan of the band as well. And I got VIP tickets so we could meet the band ahead of time and everything. I checked back 30 minutes later and the, it was sold out. They only do small venues, 250 people at the most. Um, and when you're in a small room with a low ceiling and the music is really loud. It's just, you feel it as well as hear it. The way music's supposed to be. I mean, man, like most people wearing earplugs, like, cause they know what, it's just, it was, I'm telling you, it was fantastic. It was so good. We got to meet the band. I actually got the band to autograph my guitar. So Disciples on one side and Demon Hunters on the other. Uh, usually I don't play this guitar. I just kind of leave it in my office on display. But I had to break it out today because I got like my two favorite bands are now on there autographed. And uh, so it was, a man, I mean, the concert was like, now I, I took off Monday so I could spend the entire day listening to all 11 albums. I was ready. Now I was, I, I was, I was ready. Now they had promised they were going to do at least one song from every album. So you know what I did? I kind of had the list then of what I wanted, like the songs I wanted them to sing. And uh, they, 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 Jesus wept and not I. And there were a few of the songs that I really wanted to hear um, that they did. Uh, and um, I mean, it was just like. It was, it's so cool because when you have bands like this, they're kind of like, like they're cult bands, like the people like them, really, really like them. So everybody in the whole place, three seconds into the next song, knows what the song is and everybody's singing all the lyrics together. They can't hear any self, but still, we're, 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 we're singing the lyrics. <clears throat> so they come down and they get to the end and they, they're, they're straight up honest, man, look, we don't do encores. We're doing one song from every album and we're down to our last song and they did the title track from Storm the Gates of Hell. Because the reality is when you and I proclaim the name of Jesus, we're not on the defensive. We're storming the gates of hell to rescue people from the power of fear that Satan has over them. Yes. That's why Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And the song ends with a repetition over and over again. Hell hath no fury at all. Because if you know Jesus Christ, hell has no fury over you at all. I just can't tell how awesome it is to be in this small little venue up in Mesa, Arizona and hear, you know, like 250 people screaming at the top of their lungs with a band, hell hath no fury at all. It was just awesome. It was, I'm telling you, it was so good for the next four days. Every morning when I woke up, I kept hearing new songs in my head that they had done. It was just like, it was, it was, I don't know any word using this. Awesome. It's fantastic. It's just one of the greatest nights of my life. I mean, my son and I just thought it was, I post on Facebook maybe twice a year to Tuesday morning I posted. I mean, I just, and my daughter-in-law said, yes, Josiah, I can't quit talking about it. My wife just heard about it. Well, she's still hearing about it. Like, I mean, I could, if y'all can't tell, I'm still a wee bit excited. It's only been a week. I'm still kind of just, you know, it was, it was, it was great. Now, here's what defines very, very talented bands. They can perform more than one genre. And Demon Hunter happens to be one of those bands. Most of their songs are hardcore metal, which is what I like. But they also have some songs that are more like kind of traditional classic rock and roll. And then they have a few songs that are very slow, calm, reflective ballads. So if you YouTube them, you might hit one. 
that's like carry me down. It's just a kind of a ballad. You'll think, that doesn't sound like metal at all. Just stay with it. <laughs> just stay with it and you'll, you'll, you'll get a taste of what music is supposed to sound like. So we get there and I got this, you know, I got in my mind, they sang most of the songs that I, they sang not I, which is, I really wanted. And so, I, and uh, they, 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 they sang some other, I Will Fail You, which is another song I really, really like. It's kind of one of their more traditional rock songs. But of their ballads, there was one I really, 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 really wanted them to perform, but they didn't. But it's okay, look, you can't have everything in life, so just suck it up, buttercup. Well, you know, you know but it, it's all right. And um, as a matter of fact, they only did like two ballads during the whole thing, because this is a concert, and um, we need to headbang and scream the whole time, because that's what you do at a concert. And, um, but, but the, the, the one ballad I really want to hear is, is my favorite of all the ballads that they do. The title of it is Fear is Not My Guide. This song's gonna be played at my funeral. But the chorus says, when time outruns my soul, I don't have to hide. Fear is not my guide. I'm telling you, when I come to death, fear is not my guide. Jesus is gonna guide me through to the other side where I'll be with him forevermore. If you are in Jesus Christ, you do not need to fear death. Jesus has given us the victory over death. I, I'm not much into tattooing band logos and lyrics, but if I ever get one done, it'll be fear is not my guide because that's going to be my motto all the way to the end because when death comes and fear outruns my soul, our time outruns my soul, I have to hide because fear is not my guide. Jesus is. He has torn up root, stump, and all and thrown the power of death away so that you and I need not fear it or fear the devil any longer. Now, how in the world can all this be true? Well, because he died for us as our high priest. Verse 16. For surely it is not angels that he helps. Jesus didn't come to die for angels, but he came to die for humans. But he helps the offspring of Abraham. Speaking here about those that come down through the, uh, the lineage, down to Levi and all them, the priests. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. So Jesus became fully human so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now I want to come back and talk about this propitiation, but I want to, he kind of makes this loop back around again in verse 18. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. See, here's the difference. Jesus, when he was tempted, was tempted like we are, but did not sin. You and I, too often we are tempted, we actually sin. So Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to be attacked and assaulted. But Jesus had victory over it so that he is able to be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, what in the world is propitiation? I'll be honest with you. I don't even use this word in church unless it's in a verse I'm reading. I'm not a gambling man, but I pretty much bet not a single person in here this week used the word propitiation in any sentence at all. Some of you are like, I can't even pronounce it. So what is propitiation? Well, the reason the term is chosen here is because it's connected with one of the primary functions of the high priest. So according to Leviticus 16, once a year on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, they would bring two goats to the high priest. He would roll the dice, they cast lots, and one of them became Atzitzel, which means we don't know where he's going, that's the scapegoat, and the other is the atonement goat. Now the scapegoat, that's the one you want to be. Because the high priest would lay his hands on the head of that goat as a picture of the sins of the people being laid on his head. And then two priests would take that goat out in the wilderness and release it to go off to we don't know where. Because when God gets rid of your sins, they're gone and we don't know where they went and we can never find them again. Amen. In other words, when Jesus takes away your sin, he doesn't stick it back somewhere that someday he can pull it out and smack you over the head with it. When Jesus takes it away, he totally takes it away. This is the picture that John the Baptist has when he sees Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the atonement goat, he doesn't get off quite like that. He didn't get released anywhere. Instead, high priest pulls out a knife and cuts his throat and squeezes the blood out into a bowl. And he dies. For those of you who aren't sure. Now, the Bible says there's a veil 
I don't really care a lot for the word veil because when I think of veil, I think like something thin, flimsy that you blow on it, it can tear. It's actually a very heavy tapestry. And so two priests would pick it up because there's no opening to it. Pick it up on the bottom and the high priest would crawl underneath. Tradition says they tied a rope around his ankle. We don't know that in the Bible, but tradition says they would. So he would go into the Holy of Holies and in there, all there was was a box called the Ark of the Covenant and on the top was a gold lid called the mercy seat. So the high priest would go in and take the blood from that atonement goat and would sprinkle it on the mercy seat as a payment, as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And God would come down the pillar of cloud and would meet the high priest. And the blood of the atonement goat would make it possible for sinful people to be in communion with a pure and holy God. Pretty cool. There's a problem. Didn't work. You say, well, how do you know it didn't work? Because they'd do it again next year. And the next year, and the next year, and the next year, and the next year, and the next year. So when Jesus came, there's going to be a difference. You go, okay, well, that's all fine, but how does that connect with the word propitiation? I'm so glad you asked. The Romans had conquered the world after Alexander the Great, and so most people spoke Greek. There were Jews scattered all over the Roman Empire who spoke Greek as their primary language, and so some Jewish rabbis decided to translate the Bible from Hebrew into Greek, the language that people spoke, kind of like you have an English Bible, and we're thankful for that. You don't mean to say, pull out your Hebrew scroll this morning. <laughs> And so they, in Greek, when they came to the word mercy seat, they needed a Greek word for it. And the Greek word they chose for mercy seat is the word translated propitiation. Helasterion, if you like Greek words. And so what he's saying here is that Jesus is our mercy seat. That Jesus is the place where sinful human beings can come into fellowship with a holy and a pure God because it is not the blood of bulls and goats, but it is the blood of Jesus Christ himself. Not poured out on the tabernacle made with hands, but in the tabernacle in heaven. There's the pattern for the one on earth. And there he gave his blood as a once for all, complete, valuable, worthy sacrifice for our sin. Therefore, we will never have to do it again. In other words, because Jesus is my mercy seat, I know that death has been whooped for me. Because he paid in full, uh, full the penalty for my sin. Therefore, because of what Jesus has done as my high priest, suffered with me as a human being, give me victory over the fear of death, died for me in my sins so that I know to have everlasting life. We really don't have anything to be afraid of even with that great enemy death. Now I know, dying is not a good thing. Amen. Apparently y'all looking forward to it. Dying is not a good thing. Sometimes it's sudden and unexpected. Sometimes it's long and difficult and painful, but dying is never a good thing. But for those who belong to Jesus, death has no power over us. Now you may be thinking, all right, you're a preacher. You're supposed to say that stuff. But look, you're young and healthy. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently y'all think so. <laughs> Actually, I don't take any kind of medications at all. The doctor always tells me I'm, I'm plenty healthy, but <clears throat> I am young <laughs> compared to some of you. Uh, and so it's all in perspective. And so you're like, you know, you, you're not facing death. So it's easy to say, that fear is not your guide. It's easy to say that you're not afraid of the power of death because you're not facing it. You're right, I'm not. This morning, I want you to hear from somebody in our church who recently was given a death sentence. And I want you to hear what it sounds like for a Christian when they stare death in the face, the difference that Jesus makes. My name is Dave Sittner. This is my wife, Carolyn. I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes 12 years ago. It has been a continual struggle adjusting my diet and medications. In October, both Carolyn, my wife, and I had COVID, and I started experiencing discomfort in my abdomen, especially at night. And friends noticed that I was losing significant weight, about 20 pounds in three months. All along, we thought the problem was diabetes. Both my primary doctor and the VA doctors thought symptoms were related to the COVID or indigestion. In January, I again questioned my primary doctor about the symptoms, and he referred me to a gastrologist who ordered a CT scan. 
Later in the day, after the CT scan, the gastrologist office called and said that I have a mass on the pancreas and lesions on my liver and referred me to an oncologist. Needless to say, we were quite shocked. A biopsy was ordered by the oncologist and we were told I have stage four pancreatic and liver cancer. When I was 10 years old, I had the privilege of attending a church camp. There I became aware of my sin and that the only way I could be forgiven and have eternal life after death was to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. All during my illness, Carolyn and I and many friends and family have been praying for healing. The oncologist explained to me and Carolyn and our children the options available to perhaps extend my life. However, there is no cure. Through prayer and discussion, we have decided to not do any chemotherapy treatments. Sure, I am afraid of the effect the cancer will have on my body. However, I trust in God, and he may yet heal me. But if perfect healing is in his plan, then I am looking forward to being with him, my son Jeremiah, and other loved ones in my heavenly mansion. If you are here and you don't know Jesus, you ought to be thinking, I want what that guy's got. Yeah, I'm afraid of what cancer might do to my body, but we don't fear death because we have a high priest named Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, for what he did in becoming human so that he might die for us in our place as our propitiation, as our mercy seat. And Father, we thank you that through what Jesus has done for us, death has no power over us. That Satan cannot use the fear of death to try to influence and manipulate us. Father, we thank you that because of Jesus Christ, fear is not my guide, but Jesus is. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.